Hopefully this is working. Hello everyone. Welcome to your first day of hybrid biology. I hope we all make it through this. Um, and I hope that I'm doing this right. So we'll just see. But let's see, let's start with um, our Bible verse for today. So as you know, we have a new Bible verse for um, the second module. So let me open that and I will share that screen with you. So our Bible verse for module two is Romans 120. And I think your book has a different translation. I just used the one that was in your book. So let me share my screen here. And let's see. So this module's Bible verse is, for his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what he has made. As a result, people are without excuse. Romans 1, 20. All right, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray that you'll help us through this hybrid class and through our hybrid classes in the future and make it productive for the students and in order for them to learn more about you. And I just pray for all those that are sick with COVID, Lord, and I pray for our leaders. I just lift each of those people up in our prayers today, Lord. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we can't read because I left the book at school, but I'll remember to bring it home now that we're hybrid. So last time, I'm going to scroll down here. Last time we got all the way through our notes to the periodic table. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about the periodic table. So find those notes. They should be on module number two tab in your notebook. And they were not hole punched. So maybe this will be a good time to pause me and go hole punch those and get them organized behind tab number two in your notebooks. Okay, as a review from last time, we learned that if you add or subtract a proton, you get a, let me go back there. Here we go. If you add or subtract a proton, you get a new element. If you add another atom, you get a molecule. We're gonna talk about that today. We learned if you add or subtract a neutron, you get an isotope. And if you add or subtract an electron, you get an ion. So today's lesson is a little bit about the periodic table. And then we're gonna talk about this fourth bubble that wasn't here last Wednesday the one that says add another atom. So we're gonna talk about what happens when you add another atom. Here's the periodic table. We've talked about it before, that the rows that go horizontal are periods, and the columns that are vertical up and down are the groups, or sometimes they're called families. And there are a lot of trends, and I alluded to this last time, that the periodic table organizes all of the chemical information of the elements in a predictable pattern. So as you go left and down, the atomic number increases. Take a moment and pull out your periodic table and look how if you go left to right, your atomic number is increasing. So if you go across any row, the atomic number is increasing. And if you go down any column, the atomic number is increasing. The same is true for the atomic, the average atomic mass number. You go left to right on any row, it is increasing. And if you go down any column, it is, decre it is um, increasing as well. The columns or groups have similar physical properties like look, texture, and also similar chemical properties such as reactivity. Um, column one, 
is very reactive and column 17 are extremely reactive families or groups. Properties and also column number one, those are all soft metals. So properties can be predicted based on the location on the periodic table. The number of filled energy levels equals the period number. And the number of valence electrons is the ones digit of the column number. So we talked about this last time where uh, everybody in row one has one energy level, everyone in row two has two energy levels, so it can hold up to eight electrons. And then uh, row three has three energy levels. And then we also talked about how we can determine how many uh, valence electrons, electrons on the outer energy level there are based on what column it's in. Group one has one, group two has two. We skip the transition metals. Then we go to group 13 has three, group 14 has four, 15 has five, 16 has six, 17 has seven, and 18 has eight valence electrons. Group 18 are the noble gases and they are not reactive. They are chemically stable and do not have a reason to gain or lose electrons. Groups one and 17 are, that says highly reactive. They are highly reactive. And groups two and 16 are the next most reactive. So groups one and 17 are the most reactive or highly reactive and groups two and 16 are the next most reactive. So you can pause me right now and take a minute and see if you can answer the following questions. Okay, hopefully you've worked on answering these questions and now let's go through them. The first one is magnesium, the number four, chlorine and chlorine. This is just an overview of what we talked about in class that the first column are the alkali metals, the second column are the alkaline earth metals, the transition metals are the middle, then we have the other metals which are underneath the stair step that divides the metals which are on the left side of the periodic table from the non-metals that are on the right side of the periodic table. Then we have the non-metals which are green, the halogens which are also non-metals but just specifically the halogens, noble gases are group 18. The alkali metals in group one are easily react with other elements. One electron in their valence shell. They are softer than other metals and they explode when they come into contact with water. Group two alkaline earth metals are metals with a shiny silvery color, silver white color. They're found in the earth's crust as compounds in rocks and minerals and they easily react with other elements. Transition metals are good conductors. This is where we get copper and other conductors that we use in all of our appliances and electronics and our um, heating and air, our wiring in our homes. They are very hard. They have a high melting and a high boiling point. The other metals that were green, uh, that were pink, I think, on that periodic table. The, they are solids with a relatively high density. They are opaque and they bend easily without breaking. The metalloids are the ones that touch the red stair step and they have stripes going through the um, element symbol on the periodic table and they have properties of both metals and non-metals. Some are semiconductors, which means that they can carry an electric charge under special conditions. The non-metals, group 14 through 16, above the metalloids, they do not conduct electricity or heat very well. They exist in two of the three states of matter at room temperature. They are either gases or solids. They have no metallic luster and they do not reflect light. And they do gain electrons easily. The halogens are group 17. Halogen means salt former. They all have seven electrons in their outer shell and halogens only exist as compounds in nature, not as free elements. The rare earth elements down below, they are all synthetic, uh, no, excuse me. 
They are all metals and they all conduct electricity very well. Some of them are synthetic man-made, but not all of them. The noble gases have a maximum number of electrons possible. So they're stable. They don't form compounds easily and they are all gases at room temperature. Okay. Alrighty. So now I'm going to teach you about that bubble, the fourth bubble I added, which um, we had that it would form a molecule. If two atoms joined, it would form a molecule. So let's look at how um, different elements, atoms of elements, form together to make a molecule. Okay, in your book, we are on page 43, molecules and compounds. Um, molecules are uh, chemicals that result when two or more atoms join together chemically, and a compound is a molecule that contains atoms of at least two different elements, two different elements. So let's look at what that means. So we can have, if you look at page 44, we can have oxygen, O2. So O2, we have O2. And that is an oxygen bonded with another oxygen, two oxygens. And so uh, we call this carbon monoxide. And this would be a molecule because these are the same atoms joined together to make a molecule. Then if you look on the same page, you have CO2, CO2, which is carbon and oxygen bonded together to make carbon dioxide. And this is a compound because these are two different elements, carbon and oxygen. Alrighty, let's look at CH4. CH4 is a carbon with four hydrogens, and it's known as methane. It is also a compound, it's an organic compound. You'll learn more about that later. Um, but let's look at what these are. So we're working on today, okay, so if you have two atoms, that join together here, or two atoms of different elements that join together, then what does that mean for, or what does that, I'm really hoping that it's not backwards on your screen. Stella, do you think it's backwards on your screen? Like, look, look at, look, the writing is backwards. So do I have to write on the computer? I can't do it like this. I don't know. Okay, we're just I'm gonna keep going. And if it's totally backwards, then give me some little paper. I'll, well, picture. I'll send you a picture. All right. And then I'll figure it out for next time. Okay, so we want to investigate what what are these? What are these lines here? What are these lines about? Those lines are the bonds. Those lines are the bonds. And we're gonna study three types of bonds today. We're gonna to study ionic bonds. We're gonna study covalent bonds. And we're gonna study hydrogen bonds. Okay. So let's first, I'll flip this upside down, let's first study ionic bonds. Ionic bonds form when electrons are transferred. So ionic bonds, electrons are transferred 
from one atom to another. So if I have Na and I'm going to draw a Bohr model of sodium, let's say, let's see if there's all right, I'm gonna draw a Bohr model of sodium. Let me grab my the first one, I'll have two electrons, and sodium has eleven electrons. So I will have two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Okay. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I should only have seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Wait. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, I got two. Here we go. Figured it out. So I've got two on the first, eight on the second, and one on the third. Okay. Then if I have chlorine, two on the first, eight on the second. I'm going to make these X's so that you can keep up with them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that should be 17 electrons here and 11 electrons here. Two on the first, eight on the second, that's 10. Seven on the third, that's 17. So we know that the magic number here that everybody wants on their outer energy level is eight. Eight, um, it's called the octet rule. So we want eight on that outer shell. And we talked a little bit about this in class. Is it easier for this one to gain seven more or just lose this one? Well, it's gonna lose this one. And this one's gonna go over here, okay? So now chlorine, ha and I'm gonna take it off of here. Okay, so there it went. It used to be right there. Okay, and it went over there. So now sodium went to 10 electrons. And chlorine went to 18 electrons. This one still has 17 protons. This one still has 11 protons. What does that make the charge? It makes this charge one positive, and it makes this charge one negative. And this has formed an ion which is an atom that has lost or gained electrons and now has a charge. This is also an ion. It has lost or gained electrons and now has a charge. And when two of these bond, this makes that line we saw before, this bond joins these two together. We call this an ionic bond. We call that an ionic bond. Okay. Now let's look at the second type of bond that we're looking at. The second type of bond, so we just did ionic bonds. And that's when they lost, gained um, electrons. They have been transferred to form the bond. Now we're going to talk about covalent bonds. Covalent bonds result from shared electrons. So let's look at methane, CH4, which is methane, which I drew earlier as such. 
Okay. And I told you that this represents a bond. So a bond is two electrons. This represents two shared electrons here. A bond here in covalent represents two shared electrons. So carbon, and I'm going to use just the valence electrons here. So carbon has four valence electrons. So I'm going to put four dots just around carbon. These are just the valence electrons. And then hydrogen has one valence electron. So how many hydrogens, if this needs eight, it only has four, how many hydrogens would it need? It would need four hydrogens to come in and share its valence electron. So this is an atom of hydrogen, this is an atom of hydrogen, this is an atom of hydrogen, and this is an atom of hydrogen. And they are all sharing their one electron with, with carbon. In exchange, carbon is sharing its one electron with hydrogen. So now each of these hydrogens has two, which it's happy with two. It wants to be like helium. So each hydrogen has two and the carbon is set with all eight and they're sharing and that's how covalent bonds are formed and so underneath this line would be these two shared electrons okay the last type of bond that your book talks about are hydrogen bonds so let's flip the board and talk about hydrogen bonds. Okay, so we have water. Okay, water is called the universal solvent. It is um, able to dissolve polar substances. It is able to dissolve charged ionic compounds. Um, so it is how we make sweet tea and lemonade. Um, it's how we dilute cleaner cleaning solutions. Um, water is known as the universal solvent. It's what we use to dissolve things. Okay, it's what we use to dissolve things. It's not being dissolved. It is the one doing the dissolving. Okay. And just as a side note, dissolving is a physical property. It's not a chemical reaction. So just keep that in mind. This is not a, dissolving something is a physical change, not a chemical change. But let's draw the, com, the water uh, molecule. So we have oxygen here. Oxygen has six valence electrons. It needs two more, so it needs two hydrogens. So hydrogen comes in like this. Now, if you see, we have kind of an upside down sideways Mickey Mouse. Okay, here's an ear, M-I-K-M-I-C-K-E-Y, M-O-U-S-E. So there's your Mickey Mouse shape. Now, if the hydrogen only has one proton and one electron and it put its negative part over here, then its positive part is sticking out over here, its positive proton. And if its negative electron is here, its positive part, the proton, is sticking out over here. And all that's over here are four electrons. So this makes this side a have a negative charge. And we call this a polar molecule because it has charged ends. The way that it is shaped, it's not, it's not an ion, it's not made from ions. It's not made from ions that have a charge. It's just the way that it's shaped causes it to have charged ends, a positive end and a negative end. Okay. So let me look and see where we need to be. So 
So in this section that I have taught you now, you have vocabulary words molecule, compound, chemical bond, which are ionic bond, covalent bond, the word ion, you have polar compound, and hydrogen bond. I didn't talk about that specifically. A weak electrical attraction between a partially positive hydrogen atom and a partially negative atom of another molecule, usually oxygen or nitrogen. Okay, let's talk about the words that go with the word solvent. I think those are the last words here. So I use this word solvent. So there's several, let me erase and flip, words in your text. Okay. So you have the solvent, and I'm going to make a cup of um, hot chocolate. Okay, make a cup of hot chocolate. So I have the solvent and the solute. So in my cup of hot chocolate, my solute is the hot chocolate packet. It is the thing being dissolved. In my hot chocolate, which I'll put some marshmallows in it and some steam, the solvent is the hot water. It is doing the dissolving. And once you have these two things together, you have created a solution. Now, solutions can use other things to dissolve. You can use ammonia in the lab, or um, you can use lots of different liquids in reactions. Um, well, it wouldn't be a reaction, but you can use other liquids. Normally, it is water. Um, but when it is water, we call it an aqueous solution. Meaning that it was specifically dissolved with water. Okay. And by there, I mean that water, let's write this down to water was the solvent. Do we? Are using our vocabulary terms. Okay, let me go back to the book here. Alrighty. If you look at page 55, there's an excellent graphic on life supporting properties of water. It is a good solvent because it's polar. So it will dissolve a lot of things. Um, it has adhes adhesion, the attractive force between two particles of different substances. Cohesion, the attractive force between two particles of the same su substance. The ability of water to contain large amounts of thermal energy before increasing in temperature is a high heat capacity. It's unique in its density in that the solid is less dense than the liquid, so the solid floats in the liquid. The surface tension is the downward pull on hydrogen bonds on surface water molecules that forms a skin. Water forms hydrogen bonds, so it's sticky. All right, so just a good graphic about all of the ways in which water is unique and very important. And your book talks about how that's the first thing that they look for on another planet or on another place they discover is to see if there is any water. Okay, I think I want you, because this is supposed to be an hour long class and as you know, I don't talk for an hour. I let y'all do things and, and read or do activities. So I'm going to email out easy instructions 
for an investigating waters properties lab. Um, and I think it'll use just easy stuff like a coffee filter and a penny. And um, the only thing that you would have to do is if you don't have a dropper, maybe drop water off of the edge of a pencil um, or a pen to let it drop one, one drop at a time. So I will work on putting together an easy to follow at home properties of water lab, complete that, and then write it up in your lab notebook. And then on Wednesday, we will have another lab and we'll talk more about the properties, a little bit more about the properties of water, but then we'll start talking about organic molecules. So let me make sure that that's, this is my first time doing a virtual class. So I don't even know where to look. <laughs> um, go ahead and read through. Uh, we kind of just went over it. Um, but there's on page 52, it talks about the reason that um, water is such a good solvent is because it's a liquid at room temperature. Um, we talked about the positive and negative sides to it. So it will, um, it will dissolve a lot of different compounds. Um, when hydrogen bonds form between two water molecules. So when, so when another water molecule, let me show you this, this is called cohesion. So let me show you this on my board here. So if I have another water molecule that comes up to this water molecule, then how is it going to position itself? So um, it will always position itself with the negative side of one molecule and the positive side of the next water molecule would be here. There's my Mickey Mouse shape. Okay. And then here is my Mickey Mouse starting here. So then I would have another positive part come here. So they're always going to line themselves up positive to negative, and that gives them um, another force where they're stuck together called cohesion, okay? And then adhesion is the attractive force that holds molecules of different substances together. Um, and I think the book talks about, um, let's see. It's just talking about um, cohesion and adhesion helping plants get water up. And we're going to be talking about that in a whole other module. So um, just memorize cohesion, adhesion. Uh, let's see. Heat capacity, the amount of heat energy required to increase the temperature. Um, and water is, um, water can hold more than four times the thermal energy of most metals. So this property, water has high heat capacity. And then we've already talked about how solid form of water floats. It's more dent, uh, less dense than the liquid. So um, that's very unique. Most of the time, the solid is more dense than the liquid and would sink in the liquid form of itself, but water floats instead. And so we've already talked about that in class and that's on page 54. Um, you've got your on your own questions on page 55. So that really brings us to being able to talk about organic molecules on Wednesday, which is fantastic. So and we will have an experiment on Wednesday as well. We might have two, but we'll definitely at least have one experiment on Wednesday as well. So 
I'll email out your instructions for easy to do properties of water lab and we'll use the rest of our class time together for you to complete those things and um, let me know if you have any questions and if my charts are backwards back there then hmm, I will figure out how to do that differently next time so all right see y'all on Wednesday bye-bye